Yeah, so I'm excited to hear from Gordon Legg from the University of Minnesota, and uh, he will be talking about vision restoration, the dream. Okay, hello everybody. Um, <clears throat> I wish I was there with you, but circumstances beyond my control have kept me at home. Um, I want to thank James, Preeti, Santani, and others who've organized this splendid conference. I've been sitting out here in internet land, listening to a lot of really great talks. And thanks to Smith Kettlewell for 60 years of leadership in vision science and vision rehabilitation. So <clears throat> rather than giving Rather than giving a research talk today, I'm going to give you my kind of high level perspective on our topic, vision restoration. And as Santani said, my title is Vision Restoration, the Dream. So I'm gonna consider vision restoration from three perspectives. First, what is the everyday meaning, a popular meaning of sight restoration? Second, I'm going to reflect on um, what site restoration means to me as a vision scientist. And then finally, I'll describe um, my, my own reactions to Okay, Gordon, are you there? Can you hear us? Yep, yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, just enough. <laughs> Should I get started? Let me, uh, one second. Okay, so I will be advancing the slides for Gordon. So any um, screw ups there. An unsuccessful attempt at site restoration. So first, what's the everyday meaning of site restoration? I think in the strongest sense, site restoration in popular sense is the recovery of full sight from total, total blindness. Um, there's, a recent, there's a recent example from YouTube from Mr. Beast. And if we bring up the slide, we can play 10 seconds or so from Mr. Beast about curing a thousand people's blindness. Can we play that one, Santani? In this video, we're curing a thousand people's blindness. <laughs> it's gonna be crazy. Most of us see the world like this. But here's the thing, 200 million people see the world like this. Great, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, we don't need to hear it more than once, probably. Um, for some people other than YouTubers, maybe their only encounter with sight restoration comes from Bible stories, miracles restoring sight to the blind. So many of us with vision impairment have had strangers on the street stop us and offer to pray to God to restore our sight. And I guess it probably goes without saying, or does it, that vision impairment is a negative. There are um, 
quantitative measures estimating the reduction in quality of life due to vision impairment. One study using the time trade-off method found that patients with severe age-related macular degeneration, that is, acuity is less than 20 over 200, that they would trade away almost half of their remaining lifespan to recover full sight. So I wonder how many of us here that have acuity less than 20 over 200 would trade away close to half of our remaining years for full vision. Okay, so now let me turn to my vision science perspective. Sometimes vision restoration in the strong sense of recovery of full vision is possible. So let's go to my side th slide three on vision restoration, strong and narrow senses. Ophthalmology has treatments that do restore full vision for some eye conditions that cause vision impairment. And of course, a common example is cataract surgery, which I think of as a, a marvel of modern medicine that usually restores full vision to people with adult onset cataract. A narrower sense of vision restoration refers to improvement of some aspect of vision in a person with, with otherwise healthy sight. So a simple example is refractive correction. Putting on glasses restores good vision, probably to many of you in the audience. Um, roughly 60% of people in the US use glasses or contacts to restore vision. And more than 50% of acuity reduction in the low vision range worldwide is due to lack of refractive correction. Um, other examples of vision restoration in this narrower sense might include the potential use of gene therapy to restore normal trichromatic color vision in inherited forms of color blindness, or maybe therapy to restore stereo depth perception to stereo blind adults with a history of amblyopia. Now, a weaker form of vision restoration seems to apply after vision deprivation early in life. So let's go to my next slide with three famous cases. I'm gonna mention um, three cases. Many of you are familiar with these. Gregory and Wallace back in 1963 reported on subject SB who lost vision at age 10 months from an infection that damaged his corneas. And then at age 53, SB had corneal transplants, which restored some vision. And Gregory and Wallace gave SB lots of tests, perceptual tests, visual illusions, and so forth. And ultimately, SB was rather disappointed with his restored, restored sight and described the world as, quote, rather drab, unquote. In 1993, another article, a New Yorker article by Oliver Sacks, it described a similar case. This was Virgil who developed dense cataracts um, due to disease in early childhood. And the cataracts were removed, let's see, and it was 45 years later. Virgil re regained some useful vision, but was ultimately disappointed with his restored sight as well. So both Gregory and Wallace uh, and Sachs speculated on the reasons for the negative, emo the negative emo emotional reaction by SB and Virgil to their restored sight. Might it be due to a change in one's identity and way of life as a person with a vision disability? What about the time and effort in adapting to a new source of sensory input? Might there be disappointment in failing to recover entirely no normal vision? Um, might, it, might it be anxiety about meeting the expectations of others? 
And in the third case, many of you know Mike May and his story about vision restoration described pretty dramatically in Robert Curson's book, Crashing Through. So Mike lost his vision in a chemical um, explosion at age three and a half. 43 years later, he had limbal cell, limbal cell, um, limbal stem cell transplant and corneal transplant to restore vision in one eye. And he participated in perceptual and brain imaging studies with, with Ioni and colleagues and with very interesting and important results. And we even heard something about uh, Mike's motion, auditory motion perception yesterday. Mike adapted to his vision restoration more effectively and with less emotional disturbance than SB or Virgil. So in these three cases, the individuals achieved low vision, not full vision. Uh, Mike May's acuity range, something like the range 20 over 500 to 20 over 1,000. Um, they could identify these three cases, people, they could identify simple shapes, but not faces. Um, they had trouble with 3D distance cues. They made use of touch to guide visual recognition. General conclusion seems to be that if vision impairment has onset prior to full visual development, restoration of vision later in life is quite limited. So this is a weaker sense of vision restoration. Okay, let's go to the next slide and we'll turn to high-tech vision restoration. So there are exciting findings. We've heard about them in the conference relative to vision restoration, research on stem cells, optogenetics, CRISPR, prosthetic vision, gene therapy, probably others. I'd like to briefly comment on prosthetics and gene therapy because they're the only ones with FDA approval uh, for patients, as far as I know. So let's go to the next slide, some brief comments on prosthetic vision. So since most vision impairment results from disorders of the eyeball or optic nerve, what about bypassing the eye and directly stimulating the visual cortex? We just heard about that from, from Dan. We can go back to Brindley and Lewin, 1968, demonstrate the plausibility by eliciting visual percepts with electrical stimulation of cortical neurons in a blind nurse. And near the end of their pioneering paper, they wrote, and I'll quote, our findings strongly suggest that it will be possible by improving our, our prototype to make a prosthesis that will permit blind patients not only to avoid or to avoid obstacles when walking, uh, but and also to read uh, print or handwriting, perhaps at speeds comparable with those habitual among sighted people. So we're now more than 50 years later, uh, the state of the art in prosthetic vision may be approaching the goal of providing vision sufficient to avoid obstacles while walking, but we're still not close to providing vision sufficient to read print at speeds comparable to sighted people. Most of us are aware of the impressive body of research on retinal implants, including the success of Argus II. Um, Michael talked about that. Um, but retinal implants deliver at most a narrow field of ultra low vision because the vision is too coarse to be measured with conventional acuity charts. Um, questionnaire method called FLORA has been developed and showed that Argus II was helpful in some daily tasks, such as finding doorways, crossing streets using the lines of a crosswalk visually locating a place setting on the table or determining the direction of 
people walking by. And I think we saw some examples from Michael, Michael's uh, interesting pulse to percept demos. Ross Doerr is a retired attorney who received an Argus II retinal implant in his 60s after many years of nearly total blindness. And he's written a, a rather interesting um, memoir describing the trials and tribulations he's experienced. I'll just quote um, one thing from him, quote, I used to be sighted. I know what I'm missing and I want as much of it back as I can get. If I pass at this, will I blow my last chance for some eyesight? Now, a question that I often ponder when thinking about retinal prostheses, from a purely functional point of view, is it more promising to design high tech to deliver visual information along a damaged visual pathway, that would be prosthetic vision, or perhaps to recode the information for an intact auditory pathway, let's say echolocation or soundscapes, or maybe for touch, let's say tactile displays. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna comment a little bit on gene therapy. So inherited diseases of the retina and optic nerve are important causes of low vision. And there, as we know, there's intense research and hope pinned on developing gene therapies for, um, for these inherited eye diseases. The major success so far is a Luxterna treatment for Leber congenital amaurosis, LCA. So LCA, this is a subtype of retinitis pigmentosa with onset during early childhood with rapid progression of vision loss. The first symptom is often um, difficulty seeing at night. So the gene therapy involves replacing a defective version of the RPE65 gene by a healthy, healthy version, healthy, healthy variant engineered into a viral vector and delivered into the eye by needle injection under general anesthetic. And in 2017, this was the first FDA approved, approved gene therapy, as far as I understand it, of any kind. So what kind of restored vision results from Luxterna gene therapy? Um, as, I, as I understand it, there are two benefits. First, FDA approval was based on evidence for improved night vision. And being able to function visually under low illumination is certainly helpful. And second, the treatment may, may halt or forestall progressive decline of, of vision. And if so, this would be a major benefit. So in short, these high-tech methods of vision restoration, vision prosthesis, gene therapy, provide some vision benefits so far to a relatively small number of people at high cost. Um, they're promising, they're definitely worth continued development, but they're not close to restoring full sight to the blind in that strong sense of the term. Okay, let's go to the, my last slide, which is, uh, I'm gonna turn to take a more personal perspective now. So in 2009, um, NPR, National Public Radio, so solicited short essays from listeners entitled, This I Believe. At that point, I'd recently gone through an attempt at vision restoration. I had limbal stem cell and corneal transplants, very similar to the procedure Mike May went through, although my prognosis was less favorable than his. And at the time, actually, Mike was a good source of advice and counsel. So in my, my NPR essay, I began by introducing myself as a university professor specializing in vision science. And then I'm gonna take the liberty of 
reading kind of a somewhat condensed version of what, what I wrote in that essay. So, quote, you, you may find it surprising that I devoted my life's work to vision research when I'm nearly blind myself. I see enough to read highly magnified print on a display screen, but I rely on braille and computerized speech for most of my reading. I carry a white cane, I recognize people by their voices. It's true that visual impairment poses practical challenges for me, such as difficulty in accessing print, reduced mobility in a country um, reliant on driving, and the inability to identify friends across the street and students in the classroom. For much of human history, the practical impediments caused by blindness were quite devastating, consigning most visually impaired people to life on the margin of society. I'm lucky to live in a time when society is beginning to embrace the idea of universal access, access that um, accommodations are enabling people with disabilities to join the mainstream. And then I'm gonna skip on a bit here. Many people believe that we are the sum of our experiences and that vision provides the primary source of these experiences. They believe that even if the practical barriers of blindness can be overcome, life without vision would be incomplete. There would be a, a gaping hole in the fabric of life. Well, I don't accept this view. I'm gonna borrow a literary metaphor, I guess from John Steinbeck, probably others. Um, our lives are tapestries. We, leave, we weave our tapestries from the fabric of our daily experience. Our happy and sad moments, our exciting, inspiring and disappointing endeavors, the good and the bad that befall us. Yes, Vision impairment has had an influence on my personal tapestry, but my tapestry has been shaped um, by my lifetime of interactions with family, friends, and students, and not by the blurry images on my retinas. Would I like to have my sight restored? When asked this question, a friend and former student of mine answered by saying, I'd like to have vision, but only for three days a week. So this, this answer kind of reveals an ambivalence I share. My personal tapestry has been woven during um, my lifetime with impaired vision. It expresses who I am, where I've been and what I've done. Sure, I. I'd like to uh, visit the land of the fully sighted. A few years ago, I elected to try a new medical procedure aimed at restoring my vision. I decided that the energy cost and risk were worth the chance of visiting the land of the seeing. After several surgeries and um, protracted treatment, the effort failed. Am I disappointed? Yes. I wish the outcome had been better. But this medical episode is just another meaningful square in my personal tapestry. So I'll hold it there and say thank you for listening for my, uh, my high level perspective. Thank you, Gordon. Um, while Preeti finds a question in the room, I wanna um, turn to the chat really quick. Um, it was, there was a comment that is a reaction to something you said earlier, but seems to fit as a follow-up. Um, uh, commenter Gina says, blindness is not inherently negative. I know it's a bit radical, but even prior to developing non-optic sight, I would not trade my perception for perfect typical vision and all the money in the world. 
the medical model of disability and blindness is loud in this conference, and I just want to be a small voice for an affirmative social model of human ability and blindness in particular. Yeah, and I, I fully accept that uh, view, and I endorse it. I think there are different views and this sort of intrinsic feeling that vision impairment is negative or pejorative is, I, I was trying to imply that that's a prevailing view, but not, not the universal view. So thank you for that, that comment. Gordon, uh, thanks for your talk. It was great. It's Josh Mealy here. Um, uh, great to hear your voice in this in this discussion. I, I want to ask you. You said in your in your final wrap up, you said that um, you know we're the the um, you know you were disappointed that it didn't work, um, but it's part of your tapestry. But I want to ask you very pointedly: Was it worth it? Was the medical was if if you had known what the outcome <laughs> would be, or well, let's say let's let's not say that, but but was Ultimately, given that it was that it was uh, that you were disappointed, was all the medicalization worth it? Was it worth it? Well, well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I had a pretty good perspective, maybe better than most people going into these kinds of therapies. I had a pretty good intuition or guess about the possibilities and maybe probabilities even. So I guess I was willing. I had the advantage of having one bad eye and one worse eye. So I was really gambling with the worse eye, not, not my so-called better eye. So I felt I could gamble and take the, take the risk. If it had been with my better eye, I wouldn't have taken it. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Gordon. Good afternoon. This is uh, Lodfi Maribet from Boston. I have a general ethical question for the members of the panel. Um, I'm thinking about patients, for example, who were implanted with the Argus 2 uh, device, and now the company's defunct, and the project, there are patients walking around with the device now. I'm wondering if members of the panel can talk about, is there a commitment or responsibility on the part of these companies once these clinical trials or, or, or projects are completed? Could I respond to that or wait for others? I'll wait for later. <laughs> that's an interesting and big question. I think that's a nice big one. Gordon, let's hear from you. And <laughs> I'll see um, if it's okay. I can see Dan preparing to answer. I, I just say, I'd say, first of all, I think part of the issue is are people going into these therapies fully informed of what's behind them, who's going to support them? Where is the ethical responsibility? Is it with the company, uh, the, the inventors, the clinicians? There's a distributed responsibility. And part of it is full disclosure. I know it's very hard to make full disclosure to people. I, I quoted that Ross Dorr because he was speaking about this from the perspective of knowing that the company had failed, was not supporting it. But given all of his trials and tribulations, he still maintained that it was worthwhile. So I think there are different views, but it's, it's a tricky issue. In the interest of time and coffee, let's take about 15 minutes and then come back for the second half. But that was basically my question too. So I promise you, we won't let that issue go. Okay, thank you. Thanks.